Chris, was there anything else, any other exhibits we needed to, to address? I'm <laughs> <laughs> The other 450 exhibits that we need to address. 452. We'll hop back to you. 452. Address one. those in detail. Exhibit 322 is that a copy of the report from August 29th of 07. Yes. Okay. And Exhibit 321, a copy of the report dated October 19th of 07. Copy of the report dated June 27th of 08. Yes. And Exhibit 316, a copy of the report dated September 17th of 09. Copy of the report dated September 21st of 09. Yes. Exhibit 318. Copy of the report dated September 28th of 09. Exhibit 317, copy of the report dated March 9th of 2010. Yes. Exhibit 315, copy of the report dated March 29th of 2010. Copy of the report dated March 23rd. 
2015. Yes. Does that cover them all? I believe so. We move those reports in as evidence. No. Very well. They can be received in evidence. Mm -hmm. and, and lastly, uh, as you examine some of these items, did you take some photographs? I did. Uh, I'm showing the location you were able to take cuttings or samples. Yes. And you got a chance to review this board to see if those are the photographs that you took. Yes. All of them. We would move exhibits 193, 194, 208, 209, through 217, 218 as well, 283 through 289. And it's in display via the computer. Let them be received into evidence. <coughs> You'll just briefly tell us uh, what we'll be looking at in this photograph. This is the, the striped uh, sweater from Shannon Christian. And this is a close up of where you would have. Yes. The, um, the stain on the left is uh, stain B, and the stain on the upper right is stain A. Uh, this is the white tank top from Shannon Christian. Are these markings on there, are those your markings? Yes, they are. And would that be where you would have taken a sample or a cutting? It's where I was doing some initial screening for the uh, possible presence of semen with an alternative light source. Is that 209? Uh, that is a small stain, uh, stain A, from kind of an interior bra that is part of the tank top. And can you remind us again what that stain was? That one is uh, stain A from my exhibit 15A. And uh, the non sperm fraction was consistent for the mixture. Um, from Shannon Christian, and then a minor contributor was inconclusive, and the sperm fraction uh, matched Latalvis Collins. That's the bottom portion of that same tank top, and just above where the ruler is, you can see a, a small circled area with a, a plus sign in parentheses, and that is uh, stain B. And that's the one that had also the DNA. Yes. Yeah, there's a close up. That's a close up of the same B? Yes. Looking at the genes now, is that correct? Yes. Let me back up the markings uh, real bit there on the see on the right are both legs and those are markings. Yes, they are. Side of the jeans, side. Yes. <clears throat> this is uh, stain A. It was on the uh, lower left leg. Lower left, which right or left leg? It it's on the left leg. Is that cutting A? Or? Yes, it would have been. Yeah, area A or cutting A from the jeans, and uh, you can actually see the little squares missing from the fabric. That would have been where I would have taken sampling. And then that has the DNA of uh, Marcus Davidson? Yes. Cutting A and cutting C, correct? Yes. Is that just a close up of that? I believe that is cutting B. From closer up uh, on the, the right pant leg. Okay, B, is that the that the designation there? Yes. And again, that had the uh, sperm fraction with Talbot's Collins? Yes. 
216. Mass uh, cutting C from inside the, the crotch area of the jeans. And then that had the, the firm fraction DNA of the Marcus Davis? Yes. Is it 217? That's uh, cutting D, and it's from the, the rear of the jeans on the back seam. And again, the sperm fraction of the talus mm -hmm. cottons. Uh, actually, I think that one's a blood stain, a presumptive positive for blood. Is that B or D? That was uh, D. D is a boy. Uh, D is oh, in D is in dog, okay. um, and so that's cutting D, and that was presumptively positive for blood, and uh, was consistent with Shannon Christian. That's cutting E, and cutting E was on the front of the jeans, uh, on the thigh area of the right leg. This is the floral fabric. Is that all the pieces of the floral fabric that you examined? Yes. Is that there in your lab where it's laid out? That was in our, our previous laboratory, previous yes. Lab. 284. Uh, this is a, a close up of um, some of those pieces just to kind of show where some of the actual circled stains were taken from. And 285 is a close-up of one of them. Uh, 285 is a close-up of what I can see is stains uh, F, G, and H. F, G, and H? Yes. And then those include the sperm fraction of the marked stains. It's not all of them, but some of them are right there. We need to go back and refer. Yeah, uh, stain F in the top left corner. Uh, the non sperm fraction matched Shannon Christian in the sperm fraction. The major contributor was Shannon Christian, the minor was inconclusive. For that, but that was F. Uh, G. Um, <coughs> yes. Uh, G. That one, the the non sperm fraction was consistent with a mixture where the major um, matched Shannon Christian and the minor matched Vanessa Coleman, and in the sperm fraction was a partial profile of uh, Latalis Cobbins. H, which is on the knotted area to, to the left. Uh, the DNA profile from both the non-sperm and the sperm fractions matched Shannon Christian. 286. So that's a, a close-up close of area G. 287. Uh, that is a piece of uh, white uh, fabric that is another exhibit. This, these are close-ups of that okay. other exhibit. Okay. And you've already talked about the result of this. Is that I, correct for it? I don't think I've talked about that particular exhibit. Okay. Do you recall which uh, exhibit that was? I know it's in one of the four. That is uh, my exhibit 89B. It's a white cloth strip. Okay. Can you tell us what your results would have been? Just testing if you haven't already done so. Yeah, I've not I've not recorded that one yet. Okay. Since we got it up there, so we can tell us what the results of that. Yeah. So for the white cloth strip, um, presumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Further test indicated the presence of human DNA. From the stained areas that were on the fabric, based on these results, the DNA profile matched Exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian. 
in the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA, DNA profile from either the African American, Caucasian, Southeastern Hispanic, or Southwestern Hispanic populations exceeds the current world population. And does your, do your record reflect where that script came from in this crime scene, in this scene, any scene? It's possible. Excuse me just a moment. Oh. The only note that I have in here was that it was found at uh, 2316 Chipman Street. Okay. That's fine. 289, that's just a closer view of that. That's a, a portion of the white cloth strip. Agent Millsaps, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing fine, thank you. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Now, this item was actually in two of your reports, correct? I believe it was in your report from 917 of 09. And is that correct? Yes. All right. And in that one, you were looking, I think, for the presence of spermatozoa or that sort of thing, DNA? Uh, on the white cloth strip? Yes, ma'am. I examined it for uh, semen as well as for blood and then also for touch uh, skin cells. Gotcha. And I think that it was also in your report from 92909, correct? I believe it's uh, 92109, but yes. 92109, okay. Thank you. Um, and again, I don't know what the exhibit's numbers are at, at this point, but those two reports, now you've obviously taken some cuttings and looked at those. If we can first maybe talk about the report from 917. Okay. In regards to that strip, could you please go through your results as far as... Uh, sure. uh, I actually started and already gave you a portion of it, and I can continue with that. Okay. That's okay. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, so I gave you the results for the stained area, and then what I did is broke this white cloth strip into four different um, portions, and so I'll give you the results for each one of the four. Okay. For tape lift area one, which is the knotted end of, of the cloth, based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material from at least three individuals where at least one minor contributor is a male. The major contributor of the profile matches Exhibit 1A, or Shannon Christian. The dominant minor contributor of the profile is consistent with Exhibit 70A, or Vanessa Coleman, and the two locations that were inconclusive due to insufficient and degraded DNA. Information regarding additional minor contributors is inconclusive due to insufficient and or degraded DNA. From the major contributor, the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from either the African American, Caucasian, Southeastern Hispanic, or Southwestern Hispanic populations exceeds the current world population. For the minor contributor, the probability of having an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the African American population is approximately 1 in 39 million. The Caucasian population is approximately 1 in 13 million. Southeastern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 24 million. And the Southwestern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 16 million. From tape lift area 2, based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material from at least three individuals where at least one contributor is male. The major contributors are consistent with Exhibit 1A, Shannon Christian, and an unknown individual. Information regarding additional minor contributors is inconclusive due to the complexity of the mixture. And then tape lifts area three and four. Uh, based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material. The major contributor matches Exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian. Exhibit 68A, LaMarcus Davidson, and 70B, Daphne Sutton, cannot be excluded as the minor contributors to the profile. Information regarding additional minor contributors is inconclusive due to insufficient and or degraded DNA. 
For the major contributor, the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from either the African American, Caucasian, Southeastern Hispanic, or Southwestern Hispanic populations exceeds the current world population. While we have the report, this is again the one from September 17th, 09. I just summarize and tell me if, if this is incorrect. You also tested uh, some panties, and those came back to be in Shannon Christian's DNA, correct? Yes. Okay. And then there was a white glove from the front passenger side floor, and there was also a white glove for the rear driver's side floor, correct? Yes. And on both of those, we have a genetic material of at least three individuals, but you weren't a, well, okay, I guess on C, that being the glove from the front passenger side floor, there, there's a mixture of three people and the major contributors to the profile are, are unknown individuals, is that correct? Yes. So those are not somebody who was submitted to you as one of the known DNA samples that you were given? Yeah, well, it would have been compared against uh, the people that I had and I, I didn't see any matches, so they're unknown. All right, so that would include Eric Boyd? Yes. And likewise on the other glove, it's the same same thing, is it not? Yes. Okay. Now, going on, again, we're talking about this white strip, and this is from the report from the 21st of 2009. I believe this is the one where you were looking at the blood. I guess, what's the difference between I know there's additional stuff listed on the report from the 17th. What's the difference between it when it comes to the white cloth strip and the report from the 21st? Um, there's two differences. This one actually combines uh, results from the September 17th and the 18th report to okay. include the um, presumptive test uh, indicated the presence of blood statement. Okay, so there's the big, I guess the import of this is that it indicates the presence of blood. And it also failed to reveal the presence of semen. Okay. And then also there was an update to tape lift area two. Okay. On that report. And what was the update? Okay. So I'm going to reread the result for tape lift area two. Based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material from at least three individuals where at least one contributor is male. The major contributors are consistent with Exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian and an unknown individual. DNA profile of the unknown individual was searched against the database and a match was detected to a laboratory staff member. Information regarding additional minor contributors is inconclusive due to the complexity of the mixture. Okay. So one of the profiles that was present was a laboratory staff member. That's correct. Yeah. We can go back. In this report, I know uh, we've talked about, this is the one dealing with the blue jeans from July 6th of 2007. Specifically, I direct you to Exhibit 65A, and that would be a reddish brown stains on a white towel. Yes. And again, though you did several cuttings from that, correct? I believe A through N. Yes. Total of 14 cuttings, and the results of that were it was. The results of that are that it was a mixture between Lamarcus Davidson and Daphne. Yes, to varying uh, degrees of strengths, yes, it's the mixtures between the two, those two individuals. Let me ask you, it's another one. It's also listed as July the 6th of 2007. And specifically, I was going to ask you about Exhibit 27A, which is an inflatable bed. Let me 
Would you like me to, to read? Yes, this? yeah. Okay. I was just waiting for you to get your place. Thank you. Okay, so from this inflatable bed, um, three cuttings were processed for DNA from this exhibit. From cutting A, the exam revealed the presence of spermatozoa. Presumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Further tests indicated the presence of human DNA. From the non-sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material from exhibit 68A, Lamarcus Davidson, and exhibit 70B, or Daphne Sutton. The probability of obtaining this mixed profile from unrelated individuals from the African-American population is approximately 1 in 233,000. The Caucasian population is approximately 1 in 143,000. Southeastern Hispanic is 1 in 369,000. And the Southwestern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 585,000. From the sperm fraction from that same cutting, based on these results, the DNA profile matched 68A or Lamarcus Davidson. And the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from either the African American, Caucasian, Southeastern Hispanic, or Southwestern Hispanic populations exceeds the current world population. Um, cutting C, also from that inflatable bed, the presumptive test indicated the presence of blood. Further tests indicated the presence of human DNA. And based on these results, a partial profile was obtained, which is consistent with Exhibit 70B or Daphne Sutton in the probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from the African-American population is approximately 1 in 102,000. The Caucasian population is approximately 1 in 8,400. Southeastern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 21,000. And the Southwestern Hispanic is approximately 1 in 46,000. I guess the one I'm most interested in is cutting E from that bed. Okay. The cutting E is the last one from that bed. Um, on that one, the exam revealed the presence of spermatozoa. From the non-sperm fraction, based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with Exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian. The probability of an unrelated individual having the same DNA profile from either the African American, Caucasian, Southeastern Hispanic, or Southwestern Hispanic populations exceeds the current world population. And from the sperm fraction, Based on these results, the DNA profile is consistent with a mixture of genetic material. The major contributor of the profile is consistent with Exhibit 1A or Shannon Christian, and information regarding the minor contributor of the profile was inconclusive. Thank you. I know that you've tested a great number of items for DNA during the course of this investigation, correct? Yes. I mean, <laughs> Seems like every couple of years you've got sent some additional stuff, including items in 2015. Yes. And after looking at all these different items and examining all the submitted evidence in the case, the only items that you found Eric Boyd's DNA on are the clothes that came from him that were sent to you. Yes. And the holster, but there was a limited profile that. that I think you said the odds were one in, was it 8,000 or 7,000? I think it was, yeah, somewhere in there. Okay. Yes. Uh, the holster that was found in his cousin's car. Is that yes. correct? Yes, I believe so. But from all the crime scenes and bodies, various items that were found strewn about in different places and items found at Chipman Street, his profile wasn't recovered on any of those items. Not that I recall, no. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Briefly, out of all those items that you've tested over the years and so forth, did you find the DNA profile of George Thomas on any of those items? Not it, except for anything that belonged to him. No, I don't believe so. So from crime scenes, uh, Chip the Street, inside any vehicles? No, I don't think so. Near any railroad tracks? No. But you did find the DNA of Eric Boyd on some items, correct? The holster would be the one thing that didn't belong to him. And the one thing that did belong to him was this yellow shirt, right? One of the things that belonged to him was the yellow shirt. You remember that? Yes. You want to get some gloves out so we can show that shirt to the jury? Okay. 
you're doing. You know, for some reason already. Am I doing that correctly? That's right. <laughs> Right. I did take some, yes. That's some, but what you have a whole bunch of markings that indicate a whole bunch of places where you found his DNA? Yes, yes, quite a few of them do. You know about how many, I think you mentioned maybe 14 as you're going through your report. Does that sound about right or more or less? To, I'd have to look. That's a question. We can put that up. Needless to say, that was, I understand you to say that was from the sperm fraction of Mr. Boyd. Um, on, you need to look back at your report. That's yeah, I'd have to look back. took approximately six stains from the yellow shirt through for DNA analysis. Six? I believe so, yes. Okay. And just a couple other questions. The, the testing for DNA, all it tells us is that DNA was present, correct, when you tested it? Yes. It doesn't tell us when that DNA was deposited on any item, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And I believe that you may have told us DNA can still be detected under proper circumstances, even years later, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. And you mentioned the updated report, I believe, from September 21st, where there was some reference to a laboratory staff member. Did that in any way suggest that some laboratory staff member had anything to do with these crimes? No, I don't think so, no. Is it some sort of touch DNA, perhaps, if it had gotten in the mix somehow? I believe so. He was sitting next to me when we worked this exhibit, and he was taking all the same precautions. And sometimes things it, it happens on occasion, which is why we keep our profiles on, in a database to be able to reference that. Like he still works there? Uh, no, he does not. Oh, did he get fired because of this? No. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Anything the fact that Mr. Boyd's DNA profile is on an article of clothing that he was wearing, would you find that to be remarkable? No. Thank you. All right. I think you can step down. Thank you. Dr. Melusin is swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in the hearing of this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please have a seat, Doctor. Thank you. Good afternoon. Please give us your name. Uh, my first name is Darinka, spelled D-A-R-I-N-K-A. -A. My last name is Milusnik Polchan, spelled M-I-L-E-U-S-N-I-C-P-O-L-C-H-A-N. Where are you employed? I'm a chief medical examiner for Knox and Anderson counties and a chief medical officer forensic pathologist for um, Knox County Regional Forensic Center. 
and also uh, associate um, clinical professor of pathology at the University of Tennessee Medical Center here in Knoxville. Alec, have you been uh, the chief medical examiner here in Knox County? How long? Uh, oh gosh, I, I think since 2009. Um, years became blurred a little bit all the time. What is a medical examiner? The medical examiner in Tennessee is a physician who is appointed by uh, the um, mayor and then approved by the commission to conduct a medical legal death investigation. And in um, uh, bigger counties with the regional forensic centers, uh, medical examiners are forensic pathologists, which means that um, by law we have to be board certified in um, anatomic and forensic pathology. What is a pathologist? Uh, pathologists are physicians who specialize and train in uh, anatomic and clinical pathology frequently together. And the uh, area of interest essentially is the determination of uh, um, cause of uh, disease, um, frequently uh, cancer or any other diseases. Mechanism of disease is actually our area of interest. And of course, clinical tests and laboratory tests that can be utilized uh, to um, diagnose and confirm that particular disease and the disease mechanism. And that's why within the field of pathology, um, autopsy is one of the tools utilized to determine the cause and manner of death. Are you board certified? Yes. And what are you board certified in? I'm board certified in anatomic pathology and forensic pathology. What is your educational background? I uh, graduated from uh, medical school, University of Rijeka in 1986. That's uh, in, in, in Europe, medical schools are six years programs with a last year of uh, clinical training or internship. And the, that was 1987. And then I stayed at the university for about four years to do research and teach medical students. Uh, in 1991, I came to the United States to continue uh, my uh, PhD postgraduate studies and, and teaching um, or research. And I joined the um, neuroscience team at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago. That's where I uh, uh, conducted some of my research, obtained my PhD. And then during that time, I transferred to um, state at Loyola University Medical Center, but I transferred to pathology department to then complete my training in anatomic pathology. And uh, following that, I did training in neuropathology, and then during the last year of neuropathology, I transferred to forensic pathology field and completed forensic pathology training at Cook County Office of the Medical Examiner in Chicago. And what is forensic pathology? Uh, forensic pathology is a subspecialty of um, the really large field of pathology that deals with determination of cause and manner of death when that is sudden and unexpected without medical att attendance or due to violence. And we utilize autopsy is one of the tools to come to that conclusion. What is an autopsy? It's a post-mortem examination that, uh, specifically forensic autopsy, that really depends on the circumstances and depends on the scene investigation. It uh, starts with the scene investigation and essentially we're trying to uh, answer questions as far as what really happened and whether the case was criminal or if the case has any uh, uh, public health uh, significance uh, that we can actually alert to the public as far as the disease or illnesses in the community. And the, uh, with, uh, with reference to the trauma, of course, that's uh, one of our primary foci to, to uh, figure out if the trauma did occur. If the uh, death is suspected um, homicide, then we approach it carefully as far as making sure we have proper identification on the individual. We do a complete uh, external examination. We, uh, subs we uh, add to that, or um, uh, the external examination is actually complemented by uh, full body x-rays. Uh, we are looking for foreign objects or fractures or any other trauma. And then we do external examination. Frequently, external examination is a very thorough physical examination with focus on the evidence, on the body, on the individual. And then, of course, the uh, external injuries, external trauma as part of the evidence, and then internal trauma as part of the evidence. And when I say evidence, meaning that we have to record everything photographically and also with a sampling of certain um, uh, tissues and organs because all of that becomes our evidence. So basically that's kind of uh, an extended um, description of what forensic autopsy is. And have you performed many or few forensic uh, autopsies prior to today? 
it's in the thousands, it's many. I mean, last time when I was here, I said over 5,000. I don't have the count anymore. And have you testified as an expert in forensic and anatomic pathology in state court and federal court? Yes. We would offer Dr. Malusnik Polchin as an expert in forensic pathology and anatomic pathology. Uh, any <clears throat> the court does recognize Dr. Malusnik Polchin as an expert in forensic pathology and anatomic pathology. Dr. Lewis, I first want to focus in on Mr. Uh, Hugh Christopher Newsom's autopsy. Did you uh, perform an autopsy in autopsy number A07-9? Yes. And who was the patient? Uh, Hugh Christopher uh, Newsom, 23 years old. And uh, in the course of the autopsy, are photographs taken? Do you, do you have photographs taken? Yes. Uh, these select photos, uh, would these select photos assist you in explaining to the jury your findings in this case? Yes, that's our evidence. If you could look at uh, Exhibit 21, Exhibit 20, and I'm sorry, Exhibit 219, Exhibit 220, and Exhibit 221, do you recognize those photographs? Yes. And are these photographs that you reviewed? Yes. Uh, looking at exhibits uh, 222 through 243, do you recognize those photographs? Yes. And again, are these photographs that you had uh, taken? That's correct. I'd like to move exhibits 219 through 243 in as evidence. Thank you. Very well, let me be received into evidence. And we'd like to uh, ask for permission to publish them to the jury. Granted. I want to first start with uh, Exhibit 21. Do you recognize Exhibit 21? Yes. And what is Exhibit 21? Exhibit 21 is uh, Mr. Newsom's uh, body as it was discovered next to the train tracks. You can see them uh, right here. And um, the call was placed uh, uh, that there was a body that was still some burning material around it, and it was reported by, I believe, a, a train a conductor passing. And uh, the calls of this nature go to the uh, police and to the, to the dispatch, of course, and then we have to be immediately identified uh, because we collaborate with the law enforcement. We don't work for the law enforcement, but we collaborate with them to make sure that we have the picture as is before the individual, the victim is manipulated, moved, and then we can um, do our scene investigation in conjunction with the police and then transfer that information to the autopsy to answer proper questions, uh, what really happened and how it happened. Is it 219? Uh, at the scene, it was evident that there, was, uh, there were some ligatures, and that's the set of the ligatures around the ankles, consistent of um, a brown belt and the, some cloth material. And there was also, of course, dry uh, vegetation that was stuck under these ligatures. And of course, uh, there was extensive fire damage to a large portion of the body, over 80% of the skin surface, plus the ligatures, which means that the burning happened after all the other events uh, took place. That's the rest of the um, Mr. Newsom's uh, body. We can see extensive blistering on all the extremities and, and the torso. And of course, there are some remnants of the clothing in the upper part of the body, but there was nothing over the legs or the feet. Uh, a little bit of remnant of the underwear here. And then there were multiple layers of uh, sweatshirt and some other material that uh, the head was wrapped in. 221. Uh, this was taken again at the scene, and there was evidence of, uh, of course, severe uh, burning, and even at the time of the autopsy uh, the, um, that took place the next day, because this was all happening Sunday, and I performed the autopsy Monday morning, even at that time there was a relatively strong odor that uh, smelled like a gasoline. Now, I couldn't confirm that necessarily, but that's something that then the criminalistics can work on and confirm, but it had some strong accelerant odor. In that area of the head, so this is the head 
on the item that was, uh, it was a sweatshirt that was burned now, um, that was defect. And then later on, it was confirmed that corresponded to the uh, to one of the gunshot wounds on the body in the area of the front temporal uh, scalp. Exhibit 222. Now, this is uh, Mr. Newsom as is when he came to our office, and that's the next morning at the time of the autopsy. You can see the extent of the fire damage. And uh, of course, uh, during the transport, we tried to be as careful as possible, but it's all very brittle uh, burn material. So some of that got a little bit shifted. Nevertheless, we tried to keep everything as is before we start going through the layers of the evidence. <laughs> And then the posterior aspect of the body as is, it looked like that at the scene too. Again, um, no clothing and uh, there were no shoes and no socks and I can explain later why there was sparing on the, on the foot. And there was some sparing of the skin over the gluteal region buttocks because of the position, how he was in when the fire started. And the arms and hands were originally crossed and they were tied. Actually, there are some ligatures here, but the fire damaged the ligatures and that's why, because of the contractures, the, the wrists came apart, but in essence, they were tied in the back and this is part of the ligature. And of course, some remnants of the clothing items and still we left the uh, sweatshirt and all the elements present in the head area as the last to deal with because of the evidence of injury. Dr. Lucy, how did you tell that there were no pants, but there was underwear? Well, we went through all the um, all the burn and unburned uh, cloth, whatever came with him, and there was no evidence that there was any any pants, any jeans, or anything like that. And even the the socks were not there. Also, the bottom of the feet was uh, soil had had like a thick deposit of of, of dirt, mud. Looks like he was walking on on mud and dirt uh, in order to. Uh, end up there. And that's the right aspect of the head. That will be the area of the face. This is the back. Uh, the layers of the sweatshirt, they're crumbling here. And then one thing that it's evident now, as all this is crumbling and shifting, this is the area of one of the injuries. It's still oozing blood. It's relatively uh, fresh. Uh, there was a big uh, gag, and it was a white sock potentially um, his, because it was the proper size for, for, a, for a male of, this, uh, of his size. A gag, it was secured actually with the uh, string, we don't see it right here, and it, over the entire area that sweatshirt was actually folded in several layers, and it was just now uh, half burned because of the fire damage. The sweatshirt had some strings on the back, they were partially um, securing the, the, the whole uh, sweatshirt. And so, as we examine the uh, the victim, then we go through all the layers. So the sweatshirt is removed. There's a bandana that served as a blindfold. Uh, this is the sock, the gag, and secured with uh, uh, looks like a shoelace that was tied in the back of the neck. Two twenty-six. Uh, the the bandana, the blindfold. There was some blood on it because of the injury to the head, a gunshot wound. And then, of course, there was that belt that we removed from the ankle that served as one of the ligatures. And that's the gag that was, um, uh, it's bloody because of the injury to the um, head. And uh, it was secured with a shoelace. Uh, the burning, of course, is telling us the damage from the fire is telling us that, of course, he was gagged and then set on fire. And that's the sock, that's the overall length, and that it's relatively that short sock that um, would correspond to um, a man of his size. 229. Now this is the other injury. There were three gunshot wounds on the body. The first one, as I said, in the area of the head. This is the second gunshot wound of entrance, which is rather the junction of the shoulder and the back, kind of uh, neck, shoulder, back area. And um, all three wounds uh, had entrance and all three bullets, missiles were recovered. Uh, 
this is my fault, it is a little bit fuzzy, um, I apologize, but this is the first bullet. Um, the reason that um, we mark them as such is that uh, numbers are given as they are recovered from, from the individual. It doesn't mean necessarily that's the, um, necessarily the um, order of, uh, of, of firing, uh, but in this particular case, uh, it, it, it might have been because this is the first bullet that enters on the, on the kind of back of the neck or shoulder area and has a relatively brief trajectory through the, what we call the scalene muscles, and these, this, this is where the nerves are. They damage the nerves that um, basically control the right uh, upper extremity, right arm, and then the bullet is um, recover from the what we call strap muscle. So it didn't really re uh, hit any hard elements, any bones, and that's why it's such a well-preserved lead bullet. 231. So it, on the back, uh, I told you that originally, as the arms were crossed, the, the wrists were crossed, but they were separating as the ligature that, were, that was keeping them together failed. So this is part of the ligature. It looked like it uh, could be some string or shoelace or something of that sort. And also uh, next to it, there was some um, black, almost like um, a pantyhose material. And so both of those elements were originally securing the wrist on the back and then disintegrated as the fire progressed and damaged them. 232. So of course, the blanching would be in this area from the position of the um, victim at the time of the fire. Of course, this would be protected because of the crossed uh, arms and hand here. And in that general area, there was another gunshot wound, gunshot wound of entrance number three, that entered the what we call the lumbar region right uh, above the buttocks on the left side, and then traveled steeply uh, upward. So the bullet crossed the middle of the back, that would be in this area, crosses the middle of the back, and as it crosses the midline, it severs the spinal cord. It damages the vertebrae, the spine, and the, uh, severs the, damages severely the spinal cord. So the general direction for these three bullets would be head um, right to left, very steeply downward, and kind of very slight angle front to back. The back goes uh, back to front, of course, right to left and relatively straight. And then this one goes really steeply upward and um, left to right. The bullet is recovered from the muscle next to the spine on the right side. And that's the close-up. One of the things that we determine when we describe the uh, gunshot wounds is where they're located. We kind of assign coordinates from top of the head and from the midline to their location. We try to describe the size of the wound and look for any evidence of close range firing, whether we can determine there's a soot, gunpowder residue. Uh, I could do that for wound in the area of the head, scalp. Uh, the wound in the area of the shoulder was a little bit more difficult because of all the layers of that sweatshirt and everything um, and position of the body. This one, I was not able to determine the range because of the fire. And that's the entrance point of the bullet uh, that we recovered. And that's when recovered, actually, because we uh, examine first internal organs and then go to the head the last. This was the second bullet in the series that was recovered, so we gave it number two. And that's it. Essentially looked almost identical to the first one, recovered from the neck that did not really hit any major uh, bone elements. Now this one has very slight deformity, but overall it's well-preserved lead uh, bullet. And the reason for that is that between the vertebrae there's always some room. It's not really very fixed hard bone, so the bullet itself did not really sustain a lot of deformity as it was crossing through uh, between the vertebrae and severing the very soft spinal cord. Now this is the area of the anus. Of course, we, we do very extensive detailed examination on everyone, but of course this is one area of, uh, of uh, damage that was observed. Um, this is the anal verge. This is where the skin and the mucosa come together. That's always a little bit kind of crenellated. 
So we have a little bit of um, kind of on, uh, what we call undulating sort of margin is normal. However, what is not normal is to have laceration, which is tearing of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And what's not normal is swelling and bruising that was noticed in this general area. And that was indication of damage. Plus on the inside, there were additional tears and there was some additional bruising on the mucosa or very fine lining on the inside of the um, anus and rectum. So one of the things that um, I described in my report is, of course, uh, where the ligatures were positioned, how they were positioned, and also the presence of uh, one or more. As I already said, there was the belt, there was the cloth, looked like a torn bedding of some sort. Uh, the feet had a lot of dirt on them. But other than that, they were preserved. And the reason for that, if you recall from the scene itself, there was almost like a rectangular piece of burn around the victim, looks like whatever he was wrapped in did not cover the feet. So that's why the feet did not burn. But everything else that the cover that he was wrapped in, and there was some comforter-like material that came with Mr. Newsom to our office uh, that was recovered from the areas that were pr protected, such as the back. Um, looks like uh, the uh, cover came to this uh, area, and that's why there were severe burns uh, above that and uh, preservation of the feet because the cover was not on the feet. So this is a little bit more of the, uh, the ligature, it had multiple layers. And one thing that I did uh, remark in my report, that there was some dry, um, hardened vegetation elements that were actually stuck under uh, that area, which actually would make perfect sense that if he's walking to that scene and then the ligature is put on him at that time, that some of that vegetation at the scene would be then caught in the, um, under the belt and under the ligature. And it just shows the feet because he was definitely walking uh, barefoot to wherever he was found. Now this is the gunshot wound number one in my report and that's the scalp. Uh, most of the hair has been shaved and this is the central defect. Uh, that was relatively protected and you can see by the color of the of the scalp that it was relatively protected. So the charring from the fire, it's not a concern anymore. Uh, the black residue on the margin, preserved margin of the wound, because what happens usually if the weapon is placed really tightly against the scalp, the gases and all the heat that's being released from, from, from the barrel is going to essentially expand the scalp, kind of like a, a backward um, energy release, and it's going to cause the bullet to fracture the skull and go inside, but all those gases and everything is going to kind of blow back and cause the tearing. So that's pretty typical for wounds in the area of the head, especially if the muzzle is tightly pressed against the head. Of course, he had layers of um, sweatshirt, but nevertheless, that means that it was a tightly pressed against the scalp in order to uh, penetrate for the suit and the gunpowder to penetrate through the layers of the sweatshirt and be deposited on the margin of the wound. So that's the gunshot wound of entrance. And it looks like a contact because there, in spite of the sweatshirt the layers, there were five or six like that. But the, wrapped around the head, there was still soot and gunpowder in the wound. And I'm not talking about this debris that was kind of transferring and falling from the hair. I'm talking about this black residue that is embedded in the, in the scalp, in the skin. Another indication that confirmed that sometimes these wounds in the area of the head can be difficult, but this is confir further confirmation that it was definitely gunshot wound of entrance, of course. Not only did we recover the bullet, but when the bullet penetrates the uh, cranium, the layers of the skull, then 
it, start, uh, it starts to fragment the skull in such a way that it causes so-called beveling. So wherever, whenever their entrance wound, wherever the entrance wound is located, that's going to be internal beveling, and that's exactly what happened. It's internally beveled, so this is the skull cap is removed, and on the inside of the skull, uh, uh, skull cap, this is what we see, internal beveling. And not only is that now entrance, internally beveled uh, sc uh, skull, uh, but you can also see deposits of embedded gunpowder and uh, soot inside the bone itself. So we know that the skull was preserved, the charring from the fire is not um, a factor anymore, so whatever black residue now is on the bone, embedded in the bone, that's coming from, from, the, from the muscle, from the barrel, from the gun itself, and that means contact range firing. And that is the bullet. It penetrated from the skull through the brain, uh, skull, brain, and then crossed the uh, midline and then became embedded in the base of the skull. So it, it means to penetrate several different layers of bone, which makes it deformed like this. So it's the same um, bullet. It's just very deformed, and uh, it's, a, it's a lead bullet. There was no uh, uh, copper jacket of any kind. Uh, so they all matched, and um, uh, deformity comes from being embedded in the bone. On its course through the brain, it, um, it causes a lot of damage and um, uh, pretty much severs or severely damages the brain stem and the main vessel, basal artery, that supplies the brain. So any damage to the brain stem would be immediately incapacitating. 243. So these are the remnants that were recovered uh, under his uh, body, remnants of the so clothing items. There was a dress shirt, and there were some elements of the T-shirt. There was one gray T-shirt and, and white T-shirt, and of course, um, some more of the comforter or whatever he was originally uh, wrapped in uh, that's right here, filled with some synthetic material. So it looks like a, he was wrapped in a comforter-like um, a cover that was set on fire. Now, um, Mr. Gator Children says brought in the Mac and for us, and you were talking to us about uh, the trajectory of the three wounds. Yes. Could you uh, demonstrate those three wounds for us? All the Please. So I'll go in anatomic order. Again, that's not the order of, uh, of uh, shooting. It's just the order how we describe injuries. And the first one is the uh, what we call a temporal parietal region. And it goes steeply down, it goes to the right hemisphere, crosses the midline, goes to the brain stem, and the bullet is recovered from the base of the uh, skull on the left side. So that would be the first one. In my report, the second one in my report goes from the back. The junction of the neck or nuchal region, back shoulder, and goes straight from back to front and right to left. And the bullet is recovered from the muscle of the kind of go through, but the bullet is recovered superficially in the muscle under the skin on, and stays on the right side. And then this is the last that I described that enters in the area of the, you don't mind, I think, maybe mm -hmm. bending a little bit, can I? Or uh, I don't think it bends, but I was going to... That's okay. So what happens here, it enters in the left lumbar region, it goes steeply up across in the middle. And has a very steep upward course, which is really like this. And it crosses the middle, and the bullet is recovered from the muscle next to the spine after it fractures the spine and uh, severs the spinal cord. So, unfortunately, we can't maneuver uh, this mannequin, but the uh, does the the trajectory of the bullets does it indicate to you anything about the position of the body? whenever um, Mr. Jason suffered those three gunshot wounds. So, so for, for this one, of course, uh, somebody would have to be above, well, number one. 
Uh, for the second one, it's hard to tell what the relationship was. It really depends on the movement of the individual shooter and it could be in this position straight, but could be also bent and somebody above him. That really depends on what happened in the scene. This last one would be really um, impossible to accomplish unless the victim was bent all the way, um, basically almost parallel to the ground in some fashion, because that's the only way to really accomplish uh, such a straight. Uh, so the shooter would have to be kind of under or behind with the victim being uh, bent forward. So your um, findings concerning the three gunshot wounds would it be consistent with Mr. Newsom being bent down? That's correct. Because um, if he is bent down in this position, would you be able to determine which would be the first um, gunshot wound? Now, the, with this one, he cannot walk at all. He, he would drop because he um, would lose control of his legs because the spine is severed. Uh, with this one, he can function, and the arm would be uh, immobilized because of the damage to, to, to the uh, nerve uh, plexus that pretty much controls the arm. Um, with this one, he, he, he's, he definitely cannot do anything. He's immediately um, incapacitated and dies very quickly. So for this one, he can be alive, could be potentially first. For this one, he would definitely um, go down and end up on the ground. Would not necessarily uh, be a deadly wound, but would definitely be severely disabling wound. And with this one, then he definitely cannot function anymore. So you have told us about uh, the injuries that Mr. Newsom has suffered. Is there any way that we can determine uh, when those six things happen as re in relationship to each other? Just take a look. So. Uh, as far as you know, being uh, bound, uh, blindfolded, uh, gagged—I mean, that had to um, happen relatively early because uh, we know that he was shot through all those layers. So it would have to happen definitely before that. Uh, we also know that um, the anal perforation actually happened at some point uh, within one to two hours before the wounds. The reason I'm saying that is that. Uh, took sections from that anal genital region, and I uh, prepared glass slides. That's what pathologists do in general. Just like when somebody does a biopsy on you and then send the pathology, then it's sectioned and slide prepared to look at the histopathology of, of the lesion, whatever that might be, and give you a diagnosis. That's what I did, essentially. I sampled the anogenital region, and I looked at the slides from that area, microscopic slides, and determined that, uh, number one, I confirmed, yes, there was, there's damage, there's trauma, and number two, there is a vital reaction around the trauma, which means that there is bleeding and there are inflammatory cells responding to the bleeding coming to the area. So for that to happen, um, Mr. Newsom had to be uh, alive for some time, at least you know, one to two hours, because that's how long it takes for uh, white blood cells to get recruited and they start coming to the area and then start exiting around the damaged um, tissue and vessels to essentially uh, help heal, because that's essentially a healing process, just like any other cut or any other lesion on the, on the body becomes red and becomes a little bit swollen, well, that's reaction to the damage, that's the same thing was happening here. You see it, it's red, it's swollen, and under the microscope, the white blood cells, so-called neutrophils, are coming to the region to start the healing process. And that's what I saw under the microscope. So this had to, this had to happen before anything else. Um, the, the bound, blindfolded gag that had to happen for the gunshot wounds. As far as the gunshot wounds are concerned, uh, he can definitely function with this one, so that if, if I would um, be asked about the order, I would prefer this one to be first, 
uh, and then lumbar to be second because he's on the ground. He's down when the lumbar injury happens. And of course, the right scalp would be the very last one because um, after that, you know, he is um, he's the keys. And then we know for a fact that he set on fire after all this happened because uh, the fire now is superimposed on everything, on all the gunshot wounds, and also um, we confirm the um, for the person to be alive or dead during the fire by testing several different things. We look into the airway. If one is alive during fire, then the inhaled uh, soot and, 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 and all the fumes from the fire are going to be deposited on the airway, and there was none of that. And the second thing, some of the carbon monoxide would start accumulating to a great degree, especially there's accelerant. Uh, because it's a fast-burning fire, it's consuming oxygen very fast, and then some of that um, carbon monoxide would end up in the in the uh, uh, blood, and uh, he had a very, very low um, concentration that can happen in anyone if they attend a party where the individual smoke a lot or he's smoking himself, he can accomplish or achieve that 4%, whatever was in his system. Um, I would expect much more than that with the inhalation uh, during fire, if he had been alive. And did you um, submit a sample of his blood to TBI uh, for analysis to determine if that smoke was in his blood? Yes. And did you get a report back? Yes. Uh, first. Yeah, exhibit uh, 421 is uh, carboxyhemoglobin uh, determination in the blood sample taken at the time of the autopsy, and it shows 4%. I would like to move this in as exhibit 421. No objection. Let it be received. And did you prepare a report as to uh, the cause and manner of death of Mr. Newton? Yes. What was your conclusion as to the cause of that? The, the main cause of that was uh, multiple gunshot wounds. And the manner of that? The manner of that was homicide. And did you prepare an uh, autopsy final report as to your findings? Yes. I'm going to show you exhibit Uh, this is an accurate uh, copy of uh, my report with 13 pages. Autopsy report for Hugh Christopher Newsom, autopsy A07-9. I'd like to move exhibit 422 in his evidence. Objection. Let me see. Yes. Um, was that an anal penetration or anal per perforation? Uh, penetration. Okay. Yes. How do you know, I guess, is there a difference between penetration and perforation? Well, the per penetration basically is just me means that the, the act of uh, you know, uh, penetrating an orifice essentially and the um, uh, laceration that is trapped tearing, that is part of the um, injury. Um, I guess, complex, because there were bruises and there were abrasions and lacerations, which are blunt force trauma. Based upon your uh, examination, Mr. Newsom, uh, was Mr. Newsom raped? Yes. I want to move to, uh, right did you also perform an autopsy boundary report on Mr. Shannon Christian? Yes. Photographs to be caused uh, of her, photographs were performed of her autopsy as well. Yes. 
and would some of these photographs assist you in explaining, I'm sorry, of those photographs that you had uh, caused to be taken, would using some of those photographs assist you in explaining to the jury your findings? Yes. And determine the cause and manner of death of Shannon Christian? Yes. Showing you exhibits 244 through exhibits 267, do you recognize these photographs? Yes. And what are these photographs of? These are photographs of um, uh, Shannon from uh, the scene, um, because I happened to be at the scene as we uh, accompanied um, her to our office and then during the examination a series of photographs were taken to um, document all the items that received with her that were found uh, in the trash can with her and also, of course, the trauma. I'd like to move to evidence exhibits 244 through 267. Very well. Uh, the uh, pictures will be admitted into evidence. And we'd like to ask for permission to publish those to the Okay. Okay. All right, first we want to start with Exhibit 27. Do you recognize Exhibit 27? Uh, yes. What is Exhibit 27? Uh, that, this is the scene, and the, um, in the corner of that um, uh, kitchen area that uh, we entered with the law enforcement, there was a trash can, had a lid on it, and of course uh, the lid was um, moved by them, but it was actually all closed, and that's where uh, Shannon was dis discovered. 28. So when we completely removed the lid, uh, there were some bedding, some bags, and of course there was an arm that was uh, protruding. 29. That's the shoulder and arm. 3.4. So what we decided to do, what the best thing is always, uh, what best thing to do always at the scene is that leave everything as is, because that's important evidence, and then take it um, in a tar protected so we can not only preserve the, all the elements of the evidence, but also preserve any potential DNA, and then take it as such to our office. So I believe, as I recall, that was the very following uh, Tuesday uh, when we were at the scene. And then part of the examination to go through the layers of evidence was done Tuesday afternoon. The rest of the autopsy was done uh, Wednesday morning. Of course, our facility, secure facility, uh, under surveillance, so obviously she was in protected environment, so we could um, sort of um, do her examination um, in two different phases. 245. And that says that um, tarp with the trash can received uh, was received to our uh, facility. 246. And again, nothing was disturbed. Everything is the same. Just how she was found. Uh, there was some bedding, uh, there were some ligatures that were made of different elements. This looked like a curtain. Uh, she had um, a sweater and camisole on her. This is her earring here. And there was actually uh, this plastic bag. It was one of those um, typical trash, uh, small like a trash can bags that appeared to be tied and kind of loosened on the back of her head. So her face would be down. And this is the bag that was completely covering her face, nose, mouth, everything, and then tied in the bag. And it got loosened as um, all these elements were moved to uh, find her. 247. And then you can see that this is part, part of the uh, bed cover. This is part of the ligature. That's her right shoulder. This is the back of her head, and this is the face covered with the bag that was tied and then just kind of got um, released here. 248. And a different angle just to show that uh, basically the way how the body was crammed, it distorted uh, the, um, the trash can. 249. And these are the ligatures. So we went through all the different um, elements, and it was important to see how that ligature was positioned. It was um, double knot, and it was securing uh, and uh, kind of folding her body in a fetal position to, I guess, to fit her inside that trash can. And that's what we did Tuesday afternoon. Um, 
uh, that's Tuesday after um, uh, Chris was found, uh, Hugh was found. That was the um, trash can is slid the one direction, and then her body was in five different trash cans, and this is how this is what we did essentially. Kind of took one layer, um, one layer at a time. Um, we tried to um, cause as little disturb disturbance as possible, so shows that the bag was indeed small bag, white bag was indeed covering the entire face. And then part of the ligature that is again uh, forcing her neck and body and knees to be in the proximity here. So this is the ligature that is forcing her knees here to come against her face. Because in the trash can, actually, uh, her head was between the, uh, the, the side of the can and between her knees, kind of pressed. 252. And that is just another view, uh, again, showing that the face was completely covered, and then just another way of uh, forcing her upper body to be in um, that folded fetal position. 253. And then you can clearly see now that one of the ligatures that was, that was initially visible, that's that curtain, it's, uh, it was tied around the feet, we'll see that in a minute, bringing the thighs and the upper body together because it was tied around her neck and actually some hair was caught uh, in that ligature. And the second one was actually bringing the thighs and back together to sort of keep her in that um, position. Some of the blood here. Uh, there were several sources of blood. The main source of blood was coming from the injured and genital region, and there was a one uh, smaller cut on her hand. And now uh, you can appreciate, uh, number one, the position of the ligatures, bringing the body and forcing in this fetal position. It's a little bit twisted because her knees and, and face were actually pressed against each other. Uh, you're also noticing that the upper body is closed. There were no clo clothes on the lower body at all. And um, the lividity pattern. The lividity is settling of the blood in, par in parts of the body when the circulation stops, and then the blood starts settling just like a, um, that sort of uh, static uh, way of fluid settling uh, toward the lower parts of the body. So the same thing happens with the blood. and the lower parts of the body against the surface wherever the individual is positioned becomes purple, discolored, because of that settling of the blood lividity. And over time, when that settled blood starts kind of oozing, leaking into the tissue, it becomes fixed. So it can be um, unfixed or not fixed and can be fixed depending on the time after that. So that's her lividity, meaning that her head was down, this part of the body was also down, uh, the knees were up, that's why there is no settling of the blood there, and then of course there is some uh, discoloration, uh, partly because of lividity and partly her lips, you can see how purple they are because of the uh, mechanism of that, which was asphyxial death. So after we removed all the evidence, then we could uh, proceed with further examination. Uh, this photographs was done before, before any cleaning, before any, um, um, any procedure was performed. And it was uh, peculiar, and in some parts of the body, there was sloughing of the skin, which was essentially what we call epidermal skin slippage, which really didn't make a lot of sense in the context of you know, time of that and post-mortem interval. Uh, the lividity was fixed, and that reflected the position in the can. Uh, the rigidity of the muscle, because the, the, the muscles flex after that and become very, very um, rigid within first uh, 24 hours and then up to 36 hours potentially. If the environment is warm, then all of that can uh, be, um, can, can speed, all those processes can speed up, um, um, can speed. And the problem with the, um, um, muscle is that the warmer it is, the sooner they're going to um, become flexible again. So rigidity was not there anymore. So we had to take all of those uh, elements into consideration. But one thing that did not really match, considering the overall appearance, is that sloughing of the skin, that it looks like uh, something else might have taken place, but I didn't really have explanation for that. So this is the identification photograph. 
Again, the pressure mark here is because of the head being forced in that position. As you can tell, even the next day, so this is now taken all the next day, uh, Wednesday morning, uh, the entire, uh, the rest of the autopsy is taking place. You can see that that lividity is still fixed, so it did not move, meaning that she did spend some time in that garbage can long enough for all that to become fixed. Um, purple lips are telling me that uh, there is some element of asphyxia to, to, to her death. Uh, there is some kind of sloughing of the skin on the lips, which is unusual. Now, the rest, this dark, dark discoloration that you see on the rest of the body, we tried, um, and that was one of the reasons why the rest of the autopsy was postponed until the next morning. We tried to do maybe some fingerprinting potential, lift some fingerprints from the body, but unfortunately, um, I don't recall exactly, but I don't think they really yielded any uh, uh, useful results. I'm sorry, 257? So inside the eyes, we look for the so-called petechia because whenever we suspect asphyxial death, we look for petechia to rule out certain mechanisms such as strangulation. So there was no evidence there was a strangulation. Um, her eyes kind of remained open, so there is some what we call tache noir darkening. Um, that's just post-mortem interval. And the, it shows that, that as far as asphyxial death, that it, the circulation was ne not necessarily a mechanism. There were other ways. And of course, we had a bag. That's the part of suffocation. We had the confinement in a trash can, which is a close space asphy asphyxia. And then, of course, we had that forced position of the body could be positional asphyxia. We had so three different elements how asphyxia could have taken place. And that's the opposite eye, so there's no petechia in the lining on the inside of the uh, petechia pinpoint hemorrhage that happens when there's a pressure on the neck. The little capillary is going to burst, so they're going to produce petechia, so that was not the mechanism here. And then just the drying of the eye is, is telling us that their eyes remained open and now they're drying because uh, of the exposure. 259? This is the inside of the lips. It, it's kind of flipped, so the, this will be the upper lip and the lower lip. And especially on the inside of our lip, I was telling you there was some really um, detachment of the, of the lining on the lips, and there was a lesion, what we call frenulum, that connects the, the gum with the lip. So there was, there was a lesion there. And uh, that's one of the lesions that I described and also sampled to look under a microscope if I, number one, to confirm that there is a damage to the mucosa, to the lining, and number two, to see if there is any healing, similar to, to what I did uh, with uh, Christopher and, and his autopsy as far as like the anal damage. 260. In the area of the neck, the, again, it's irregular, and it's a lividi lividity pattern, again, because of the position. There was not necessarily evidence of strangulation, and this is just a darkening that, as we were trying to lift uh, potentially any fingerprints. Now, she, uh, I, I removed actually her fingernails for DNA analysis, so this is after the fact, this is the following day again. Uh, most of this is just the um, lividity pattern. Now, so just for comparison, the day before, uh, these are her fingernails, and again, that's what I had to remove, because that's what we remove for, um, when we look for um, a different DNA, or suspect DNA. Uh, again, irregular discoloration is just the position that means that this particular hand was lower down, pressed next to the body, lower in the can, and that's why lividity remained in that area. And the same thing here, meaning that there was pressure here and then lividity around it. Again, fingernails were removed for DNA analysis. And on the right hand, actually, there was a peculiar wound. There was the sharp force injury. There was a cut and uh, did not really show any swelling, any redness. So basically did not really show any vital reaction, which is telling me that this happened pre-mortem, potentially maybe even post-mortem after she died or during the uh, uh, process of dying because the body is not reacting anymore. It's not creating, it's not bleeding, it's not creating inflammation. So that could have been actually, um, that, that could have happened during those ligature uh, placement and uh, when the either curtains or the bedding was cut, whatever sharp object they were using cut the uh, hand. 
And this is the discoloration, actually blood is starting to kind of layer and separate into serum and blood elements on the shirt, on the camisole, and the sweater. And I believe that that's the source of that main hemorrhage was most likely the anogenital region. For orientation is that this is the front, this is the back, this is the anus, and this is the what we call labia majora, um, typical female genitalia. This is labia minora, and this is the vaginal introitus. And we are seeing extensive hemorrhage, extensive bruising in that area. So the first was as is, because we have to take um, swabs and evidence before we do anything, before we clean anything, and before I uh, document any injury. So what we did, what I did is I did the swabs of the oral cavity, I did the swabs of the uh, vagina, and I did the swabs of the um, uh, anus and rectum, and those swabs were submitted for DNA analysis. And after that was done, then I can then proceed with cleaning the area and analyzing the injury. So dark discoloration that's bruising or contusions, that's the same thing and the break in the skin, those are abrasions, and there were a couple of lacerations. Abrasions mean that first layer of skin is taken away, scraped, and the laceration means there's a break in the integrity of the skin going under the skin deeper, and there was also bruising around the anus with some swelling and uh, discoloration. Yes. Let me also ask you about, uh, can you tell me the final anatomic diagnosis? So for, for the final anatomic diagnosis, uh, that's page two, that's what you're referring to? Yes. Right. Yes. So the, the first line was asphyxia, meaning um, lack, lack of oxygen. And I mentioned suffocation, which happened with a, because of a plastic bag. That would be one mechanism. Uh, B, I stated positional asphyxia, meaning that she was bound and constrained in a can with a lid on top that um, would deprive her of oxygen. And then the confirmation of that are non-specific findings because asphyxia doesn't have a lot of, unless it's like a straight uh, forward strangulation, doesn't have a lot of other findings except that infraglottic petechia, that means the petechia or little hemorrhage in the, in the larynx and the voice box were present. There was also pulmonary congestion and edema. That's frequently what happens with asphyxia. When there's a lack of oxygen, the lungs, uh, the vessels in the lungs start breaking down, the alveolar little air spaces start breaking down, and that causes oozing of the essentially uh, fluid from the serum, from the blood, into the lungs, and they become heavy edema to swollen lungs. So she had pulmonary congestion edema that goes along with asphyxia, not like an immediate death. And the cerebral edema means there is a brain swelling. The same thing happens with the, with the brain. The lack of oxygen is going to cause a series of reactions in the brain and cause vessels to ooze. And then the leaking of that fluid around the nerve cells and in the tissue causes the brain to swell. What about uh, number two? Number two, it was sexual assault. I listed the uh, perineal, that's area between the um, uh, anus and the genital region, perineal, gluteal, which is uh, buttocks, perianal, labial, like the labia majora minora that I described, cervical contusions, cervical, that's actually cervix of the uterus all the way inside the vagina. There were uh, contusions, bruises, and abrasions. And under that, I mentioned there was deep subcutaneous hematoma with early inflammation in the anogenital region. And that was actually important because it means that the amount of trauma was such that it was not just bruising, but it was a collection of blood in the tissue, that's so-called hematoma. And that hematoma actually uh, obscured part of the area that was trying to evaluate under the microscope. So under the microscope, I confirmed the trauma, of course, because that's evidence that it's now safe forever. And then the second thing I'm looking for, reaction of the tissue to this trauma, because the blood in the tissue essentially is foreign object. So whenever you get any foreign object, you're going to get inflammation around it, and so that's essentially what the body is trying to do, and the blood is in the tissue, sending inflammatory cells, what I mentioned, neutrophils, to try to kind of confine the um, 
area of the injury and then try to heal it because that's how all the elements necessary for healing come into the tissue and that's what was visible under the microscope. So one of that um, was obscured by the hematoma but there was still enough surrounding area of injury that confirmed that she survived for some time after the original um, uh, assault to manifest those um, um, evidence of trauma, survival and trauma. What about the contusions of posterior neck and upper back? So there were actually a couple of areas that uh, showed the contusions. They were actually clustered about seven inches on the upper back uh, that involved the skin and subcutaneous tissue, and there were one little focus in the muscle, so it means there was some impact on the back, uh, whichever way could have happened. And then there was also um, an area of uh, almost like a carpet burns on the on the on the bottom toward the um, uh, toward the bottom that was also evident. So that was on the back. And I did uh, what we call dissections to show the depth of the trauma. So the only really deep trauma was the upper back in one focus. The rest on the lower back was relatively superficial. Um, and if you could, can you explain to us the difference between a contusion and uh, an abrasion? Right. So the contusion is a bruise, just like any other bruise, and in, in her case it was contusion with hematoma, meaning the blood created like a, a collection in the tissue. And the abrasion basically means that the first layer is uh, stripped, scraped, or, or taken by an object or whatever to cause the trauma. Blood head trauma. So usually during, during the struggle, and in, we see it in strangulation, as we see it in many other um, mechanisms of suffocation, when there's a struggle, there's going to be some bruising in the area of the head. Uh, so it was not so easily recognizable because of the, uh, her long hair, but when we make a cut, and that's usually the very last thing that we do during the autopsy, and when we deflected the scalp, there were several areas of uh, contusions that were visible uh, under the scalp. And they were actually um, relatively uh, big. Uh, they, were, they were what we call bilateral on both sides of the head, and that would be toward the top of the head. Um, there was the what we call subgaleal hemorrhage. So the scalp has like a, what we call galea aponeurotica. That's the, the, almost like a tendon that it's uh, anchoring the scalp. and fixes it to the bone. So under that, there was what we call subgaleal, under galea, subgaleal hemorrhage, and it was the 2.3 to almost two, two and a half inches on the left side, uh, I'm sorry, on the left side, and uh, slightly over one and a half inch on the right side. And there was a little bit of contusion on the brain itself. It was, it was minimal, uh, not enough to be the cause of that, but actually the back side of the brain uh, what we call cerebellum, had a very, very superficial kind of what we call folia. Um, cerebellum, the back side of the brain, is like a really, um, has like a multiple little layers of tissue that are kind of stacked together, and we call those folia. So right there on the back, there was a tiny little contusion. Again, not enough to cause any major disability, but it's telling me that there was a major impact here that then transferred to the back of the, to the bottom, essentially, of the brain so-called kind of counter-coup injury. Coup, counter-coup, that's what usually happens with um, some sort of a, either, you know, fall or impact or a push, something against the surface that would bruise the opposite side of the brain. Could, could you explain the difference between which one is a coup and which one is a counter-coup? So the coup would be the impact right here. That was the coup, and frequently the brain itself doesn't show much, but the counter-coup is usually what the brain suffers, and that's on the, on the folia right on the bottom of the cerebellum. Number five, early decomposition, decomposition, I'm sorry, early decomposition with tissue autolysis. Right, yeah, it was four. Uh, so there was an early decomposition with tissue autolysis. That's something that was kind of incongruent with the rest of the findings. Uh, the, li the lividity was fixed, so that means the time definitely passed. Um, I would say definitely 
more than 24 hours when I found her, when we found her. But um, with the rest of the and condition of the organs inside the body, it was not really indicating you know, prolonged postmortem intervals for slippage to occur on the lower parts of the body and on the thigh. It was like a really unusual. To me, it was um, potential exposure to something, but I couldn't really tell what. During the course of your autopsy, did you notice some type of smell? I did comment that actually there was a strong smell that looked like a chemical smell, that the, but not really the decomposition smell. I couldn't really put a name to it, but it was not regular smell of early decomposition that we see or encounter in individuals. Were you able to determine the cause of Ms. Christian's death? Uh, yes. Um, Shannon Christian died of asphyxia. It was a combination of positional and mechanical, meaning mechanical precluding uh, the breathing and positional, positional preventing the expansion of the, of the chest. And um, that was essentially the main mechanism of her death. And the manner of death. And the manner of death was homicide. Now, if we could, let's go back to uh, your examination of the um, injury to the cranium and her anal genital region. Uh, were you able to determine the order of those injuries? So, in, with, with, with reference to that, it seems like uh, they were kind of happening around the, around the same time, but there was the um, anogenital region definitely suffered more trauma than, than the frenulum. Um, the neutrophils were predominant inflammatory cells in the sample that I took from the inside of the lip. And uh, in the uh, anogenital region, the neutrophils were already starting to kind of penetrate and, and surround the vessels and go deeper into the surrounding tissue, which to me would indicate that potential death was something that was happening before the oral trauma. However, the elements are the same. It's just the extent of the trauma that differs. So it's hard to tell which one is first, but it looks like they're happening around the same time. And what about the I'm sorry. The, the injury to the hand, yes, that's something that I said. Now, she had to be alive for injury to the lips, inside of the lips and the injury of the anogenital region to happen. There's no <laughs> question about it. For the injury in the hand, I called it perimortem because there was no re reaction of that sort that I saw in the anogenital area inside the lips. So it looked like it happened when either she was already kind of dying or she, already, she just died uh, because, again, it, it lacked the vital reaction. Approach. Recognize Exhibit 423. Yes, this is an accurate copy of um, Shannon Christian's autopsy report. Dr. Move Exhibit 423 in his evidence. No, Let it be received. Just let me uh, a couple things. The uh, Rate kit, did you collect the rate kit for Mr. Newsom? Yes. And I've uh, shown you exhibit 386. Do you recognize exhibit 386? Um, so as a matter of fact, I don't. And the reason for that is that uh, this is actually an envelope that will be applied on top of my envelope uh, by Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. And so once you collect the rape kit, what do you do with the rape kit? So the, the rape kits are actually prepared, um, uh, dried, and then put in, a, in a special envelopes in our autopsy suite. And then we seal it in a, in a rape kit and then send it to a um, laboratory for examination. Uh, as, as I seal, uh, or my technician and I together work on that and seal the evidence, I always put my initials on the tape. And then uh, eventually, uh, as we submit everything, uh, somewhere under all these layers of tape, there should be my initials. But that's what we do, essentially. I apply my initials. That would be the very first initial on the box, most likely it's covered with all the other initials that followed after that. I'll do is I'll open this just to make sure. But this is, this is what I prepare. And then uh, the yellow labels are ours. And the 
uh, tape, the original tape applied are ours, and then uh, rectal, this is my initial, and then oral. Uh, so this, this is my handwriting and, and my initial. And that's for Mr. Newsom? Yes, Hugh Newsom. And um, this is Exhibit 385, if you want to take a look at that. So these are the, our envelopes that we prepared. Uh, this is Shem Christian's name, and then that would be uh, marked head hair, because on, on females we collect also head and also pubic hair if there's any. Um, oral swabs, uh, the anal swab, and vaginal swab with the with my name, and then I'm also the one who signs the first evidence tape that was the sealed the uh, evidence. The clothing that Miss um, Christian had on uh, for the autopsy, what did you do with that clothing? Uh, clothing items on all suspected homicide or proven homicides are always sealed in um, evidence uh, bags, and I do the same thing. I initial the tape as they're sealed and submit it as evidence with the rest of the uh, items. And was that uh, submitted to KPD? Or did a KPD officer? I, I believe it? it was a uh, crime scene technician shade who took most of the evidence. I don't recall exactly who took everything, but I remember him um, taking most of the evidence. The, um, the bullets recovered from Mr. Newsom's body, uh, again, would those bullets have been packaged and sealed and provided, given to uh, the crime scene technician? Yes, the same way. What, uh, what I do, after, uh, after they're photographed, I put them in an the envelope. Uh, the envelope is sealed right there in the autopsy room, and then I initial the tape over the tape to uh, secure the evidence and maintain the channel custody. Based upon, I, sorry, based upon your uh, your examination of Miss Christian, uh, was she alive or dead when she was in the trash can? I believe that she was still alive in the trash can. The reason for that is the, uh, the the bleeding on the clothing items that was transferring from that area that could happen in that position. And also the, the dampness and the, that would come from perspiration, essentially. Um, usually, if an individual is already um, cold and placed um, in, in that position, there would not be really any perspiration or any wetness to the clothes. And there was a lot of, and the clothes were like really uh, wet. And, um, and just the way how she was positioned and the way how she was tied to me, um, uh, was telling that, that she was alive and suffocated in the uh, trash can. Uh, and could you explain to us uh, the different ways that a person's frenulum can get torn? The frenulum is, is, is a mucosal membrane. It's a, it's a fold, essentially, that connects the lips uh, to, to the gums. And it's uh, relatively fragile, but not so fragile that we'll get injured when we eat any, any hard food or anything like that. So it's usually forceful. Um, a penetration or forceful placement of some object or something in the mouth that would tear a frenulum. We see it in the babies in child abuse cases, but we can see it in adults if there is a forceful introduction of some object into the mouth.